thank you. I'm honored to be here. I thank you for inviting me. I must say that I'm humbled by the fellow speakers. I've enjoyed everything I've heard. And I am happy to share with you uh, who I am and what I've been doing for the majority of my life. Balance in the physical realm requires us to have an understanding, if not an acceptance, of both the visible and the invisible worlds. Reincarnation, uh, the, the idea of reaction versus action, and also, of course, the concept and the understanding of the vibrant electrical systems and, that we are, of course, all involved in. As Leone explained who I am, I will say that I was born with the gift. I very rarely, in fact, I never ever called it clairvoyance because I'm a girl and I don't want to be um, put aside or thought oddly of. I remember as a child, maybe seven, saying something to my neighbor, this girlfriend, about what I could or could not do, and she was laughing so hard that, of course, I turned it into a joke. And so it, it, I, my parents were, of course, they, I was born in a theosophical uh, family, and they nurtured my ability. They did not exploit it, nor anyone that I met exploited it. But I was terrified, and so consequently, it was not a known um, ability, especially among my peers. Uh, I was influenced in the Portland area by Perry Karsten and Anna Berkey, um, Edith Karsten, and of course, um, Leone's father, Harry Van Gelder, was incredibly important in my life. I met him when I was seven. My mother had cancer and he was practicing in Vancouver, BC. I'm seven years old and I meet this very strange man doing very strange things. And I just remember thinking, gee, this is what I want to do. I think I want to be a doctor. So I, have, I, I never lost that idea, even though I didn't actually become one until I was 30. I sort of did a circuitous route, route as far as that was concerned. Basically, as a young girl with feet in both worlds, the most important thing was to discern the truth versus imagination. And I had, I was very lucky, I had many teachers both in this world and in the other. But when you have feet in both worlds, it's sometimes difficult to be in this world. This world isn't so pleasant. This world, you see exactly what is there rather than <clears throat> what someone is actually saying. In the other world, it is exactly as it is to be. And even in the other world, when it's difficult, there's a logic to it. Here there is not such a logic. Here we have malice, and we have hurt, and we have storn, stone, pardon me, thorny thoughts. In the other world, it isn't such. In the other world, it is what is there is there. The true intent is obvious. So as a young girl, I had to learn to understand what someone was saying and what they were meaning and making sure that I responded to what they were saying and not what they were meaning. Because if I responded to what they were meaning, then I would, of course, be in trouble because they would understand, well, you understand. We've all done that. Throughout this uh, beginning for me, I had many wonderful teachers, and I had many wonderful books. And probably the most profound for me was C.W. Leadbeater. As a girl, I read his books, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly. I remember in one of his books, excuse me, him talking about a rock. And I thought, my gosh, that's just exactly what I've seen with the rock. And so it was just like he had this wonderful way with words, those of you who've read him, this wonderful way of explaining. And it was like a friend. And 
he was so easy to read and I'm probably 12 as I'm reading these and 13 when I'm reading these and I understood them and they made sense and the things that didn't make sense my parents would help me understand. Uh, Dora Kuntz of course and her you know one of my favorite books was The Invisible World of Fairies because of course as a child um, fairies or really just the little sprites were so much fun I mean and they loved children because children are not afraid and, and we aren't even asking whether or not we see them we just know we see them and so probably those of you who have youngsters who maybe even have some of this ability many times their imaginary friends are really not so imaginary and I remember um, and I've made this statement several times but the the little sprites I mean it would be I mean they were just so much fun they'd just uh, flit and and be fun and and show off and and make pretty little colors and you know I'm a child and I think it's just wonderful I still think it's wonderful but they don't play with me like they did when I was a kid I'm older now uh, gnomes were also interesting but not quite so interested in people they're kind of exactly what they sound like they're kind of brown and lumpy and are interested but not really unless you're doing something for the grounds you're working then they're interested in you but mostly they're not that interested later on we'll talk more about some of these other things but as far as being raised as a theosophist of course if I would have been born in any other family you know exactly what would have occurred I would have been on medication or in some institution uh, because it's very difficult when you really do have vision to deny it um, I'm not saying I mean it is basically something I do turn on and off and of course at this age I have far more control than I did at that age um, but it's it would have been, been very difficult for me to have been raised in any other atmosphere as I speak to you and as the the work that I do it is from experience that I am before you and when I speak of balance in the physical world I really am talking from a term and a, uh, a being of the most important part in our lives which is meditation meditation or prayer or quiet time or quiet thought is an important part of balance in this world and we in this beautiful um, Alcott has got as you know this incredible deva as many who have created these these moments in the society uh, have they knew what they were doing in terms of attracting and then we who join and we who continue this this feel and this this um, importance of study and understanding we are actually feeding the deva we are allowing her I always call them her not always are they but it, it allows this deva to be filled and to you know it's kind of a two-way street we fill them or her and she then fills the world when I was speaking earlier at Orcus Orcus um, Camp Interlia is also a very important button and those of you who do not live in Wheaton but maybe come to visit your meditation room is never to be forgotten and this is also if you're not here if you in your meditation visualize yourself in that room you also feed that lovely button where we are here for the goodness of humanity for the incarnation of all and for the the wealth of all of us and uh, I feel that the importance of connecting with the beautiful angelic kingdom is as important as the connection with of course each other of course to keep myself on task I have a few notes so in talking about the balance of the physical realm we of course have to start with self and we have to start with body and we like to look at the this lovely body I like to look at it is in terms of well really five parts this is the big CPU you know we want to keep this going because this is the guy that's going to keep all of us here 
But I like to look at the right side or the right arm as the input. So the input is the water we drink, the air we breathe, and the, f the food we consume. And so we have control over this right arm. We have control over mostly what we can breathe, and m of course what we can drink, and of course what we can eat. So that's the right arm. The right leg is our elimination system, and that of course is <coughs> this whole GI track and making sure that we have a good elimination system. And it's also the ability to, the largest elimination system in our, in our body, of course, is the sweat glands and good exercise and that wonderful flush of exercise is important. And so we can control that right leg. That right leg is something that, that um, we want to make sure you know as well as I do, if we're backed up at all, we're in trouble. We need that, you know, we need that whole system, eating well and eliminating well, either by skin or by other means. Now let's get over here to the left arm. And the left arm is the mental and the psychological and the emotional. And again, we can control it, but sometimes we don't like to. Sometimes we want to just, I don't know, let it have a kind of a way with it. So here's the emotional, the psychological, the thinking part of us. The left leg is what we came in with. It's our genetics. It's our karma. So out of the four parts, three of them we really can control. Three of them we really can work with in terms of balance. The karma is simply, I am a culmination of many lifetimes. The fact that I have the ability to see beyond this life is obviously something that I acquired in another life or another life before that. I also understand the absolute gift of this. And I am incredibly respectful of this gift because I also know I could lose it. And I would be blind without it. It would be, I'm so used to it. It would be very difficult for me. Well, we all are, as we are all sitting here, we're the culmination of all of those lifetimes and we are only as far as our slowest member. So we are as I like to think of it, we are all incarnating at the same time. And so that's why, of course, we have these programs and the programs throughout the world to help us think and to help us achieve a certain level of personal enlightenment. And personal enlightenment is something to which I hope we all have, I know we all have, I can tell, uh, experienced to some degree. Now, as has been said many times, theosophy, of course, is the study of the esoteric side of life. I don't claim intimate knowledge. I have not studied theosophy to the level that Joy Mills has. I have not studied theosophy in those terms, but as a working theosophist, I feel like I've incorporated it in my life, and it is, it is who I am. It speaks to the real me. And when I speak to you, I bring that real me forward. Although, of course, there are certain nerves involved in any kind of a lecture. I'm trying really hard to kind of step aside from those nerves and just bring that person forward. As you who are watching me and experiencing who I am, you are actually showing me who you really are and not necessarily your personality, but who the true person is inside. That's the person, of course, who incarnates. I know that uh, those of us, I've been very blessed in my life to have uh, helped several pass over to the other side. And always towards the end of a person's life, it's just such a lovely experience because they've dropped all pretenses and inconsequential things. They're only interested in what really is matters and what really matters at this very moment. 
And when I think of those, I say to myself, that's how I want to be now. And one of the mantras that I have for myself that I would hope very much will spark an interest in you, which is if you ask yourself the question, am I happy now, this very moment, are you happy in this very moment? The moment before doesn't matter, and the moment ahead doesn't count. This is the only moment that matters. And when I ask myself that question, I always say yes. It's really such a lovely feeling. And it's also an interesting thing. Those of you who have experienced loved ones who have passed, those loved ones often will communicate with you. One of the most difficult things in my practice is when I have a patient who will come in to see me, and of course not all my patients are theosophists. I mean, you know, I have lots who are regular folk, I don't know. <laughs> I think we're regular folk too, but you know what I mean. And I remember very specifically, I, I was working on this, this young woman, and um, it had to have been her son in the room, and he says, oh my gosh, you could see me, tell her I'm here, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, and I'm, this woman doesn't know me, and I just mentally said, I, I can't. I, she doesn't know me, she would think I'm just, I said, find, find another way, please find another way. I know your mother would love to know that you're here, but that's sometimes the most difficult. But we all bring people with us, and I have found that most of us have at least two beings. So I remember, I think it was Michael who was saying that the conversation about, uh, or was it you, Joy, that there were only four people in the room and they said, oh no, it was full. Well, this room's really full too. And most rooms are very full, especially, I mean, it's real interesting walking down the halls. You know, and most of the people, because I'm not familiar with Wheaton, I do not know most of these people. But they seem very friendly, and they seem very happy to be here. So, and sometimes they do perceive us and, and will um, present themselves in ways that we can recognize. And I know all of you have had those experiences. When I say the question and ask myself the question, am I happy with myself or am I happy at this moment in time? Another aspect of that is the importance of thought. What are your thoughts? What is the intent of your thought? Recently, a very close friend of mine, Linda Jo Pym, passed away and at her memorial, which was lovely, uh, I thought she was, Gary, who uses my husband, uses a walker and it wouldn't be easy for him to be outside in the memorial service, so he stayed inside. And I thought, oh, I think she's inside, but I don't always open myself up, you do understand that, because that can be too much information. So I was just enjoying the memorial service and then I decided that night I would just find out, gee, were you there and were you with Gary? Oh yes, I was with Gary. Well, did you, did you enjoy, oh, I liked it. And did you enjoy what they were saying? Well, I didn't listen to the words, just the intent. I thought, well, now isn't that interesting? So, you know, it was just a confirmation to me that it is really the intent that matters. And even though I'm flooding you with these thought forms, uh, in some instances, they're just going through you because, um, they're not finding a home and in other instances they are finding a home and it's resonating and in turn you're sending me back that information. Thought forms actually are forms and it was um, it's important that we acknowledge the the words that we say because behind the word is an intent. And it is important that we are true to that intent. And when we are with others and we take full responsibility for our words and our actions, they in turn will do the same. 
when I look at action and reaction, if we are true to our intent, we receive trueness back. If we are true in our actions, we receive trueness back. <clears throat> Part of this physical balance, this, we live in a physical world. And besides the importance of feeding myself correctly, eliminating correctly, having thoughts that are helpful, reading books that are inspiring, hearing lectures that are inspiring. It helps me along my karmic path. It helps me along my direction in life. And if I am balanced, I tend to bring balance with me. If you are the only one with peace in the room, it will be not long before another, and then another, and then another. The reverse can be true. With the clairvoyance, of course, yes, Joy, you're right, we all have auras. And we all have different looks to them, and they are, but it's true about uh, I've, Dora's favorite statement, I think, is clairvoyance is overrated after all cats are clairvoyant. <laughs> I rather like that. <laughs> Cats are clairvoyant. <laughs> I think about that with my cat. So let's talk a little bit about the thought forms again, in that when you are having a conversation, and a conversation is two-way. This here is a lecture. A conversation is when you give back to me. And when we communicate, we then form a new idea. That's where creative thought occurs. This is the creation. And we've all had the experience of being so excited in that communicative spirit with that human in front of us. And all of a sudden, this new idea is there. And from that idea comes more idea. We also have the experience in our life of not being able to communicate. Often it is with a family member and or a loved one, someone that you wish to communicate with. But it does not matter how you try, you just can't seem to communicate with them. It's not negotiating if only one of you are at the table. You both need to be at the table. If only one is at the table, then it's acquiescence. And that isn't communicating. Sometimes in our personal relationships, we do compromise because it is the only way that is practical. I'm a very practical girl. We need practicality in this world. We need to understand that sometimes it's not ideal, that boss we have. But the job's important. And it's a challenge, and the boss is a challenge. However, I guess my suggestion would be to work as well as you can your magic. Now, I use my night work for my magic. I have found it's very effective. Before I go to sleep, of course, I use meditation for my work. I use meditation for my balance. I use meditation in my life. This is who I am. So it's OK. It's life. <laughs> when I have difficulty with someone, I can't seem to, you know how it is. You just can't, you don't quite understand. What I do is before I go to sleep, I mentally bring them to me. 
and I just put them in a lovely, I usually use white light. But if it's a lovely pastel color, it's whatever, whatever feels good at the time. And then I just, I let it go. And I do it several nights in a row and see if that relationship won't improve. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but you've given it a good try. You haven't just turned your back or worse, reacted. Let's speak of reaction. We all have our sore points. We all have, uh, I don't like my ego because she gets in the way. She's a perfectionist and you know, I really don't care for her. So what I love about my job is because it requires me to be very clear in what I'm saying to you, I can't bring her in the room. If I did, oof, never mind. I mean, she's fine, but she's just a taskmaster. I prefer this person who isn't worried about time or anything. She's just present and doing what she does best, whether it's reading someone or communicating or bringing the information forward. But those little egos that we've perfected get pricked sometimes. And we get a, a feeling about it. And then we want to defend it. I mean, have you all been in that position where you're defending that position? You're just defending it no matter what. And later on, if you had a chance to look back at that, would you not smile and say, oh my gosh, why did I defend that position? I, I'm not even sure why I, that was so important to me at the time. We use meditation to get us out of that mode, of, of reactionary mode. And Dora had another, again, because of Harry and Dora, a lot of what I say is what I learned with them. And Dora had this wonderful um, suggestion, which is she would say, put a rubber band around your wrist. And every time you find yourself doing that particular thing, snap it. I thought, wow, that's a great idea. So if you have something that bothers you, that you are spending an inordinate amount of time and energy on, that you really don't want to do, put a rubber band around your wrist and maybe just give it a little tweak. So we've talked about the thought forms. I just want to say one more thing about them. And that is um, what I've observed is right now I'm giving you a sender. And you have receivers. And, and that's all etheric. OK, so that's all part of I can't see my own aura. I have a couple of times, and it wasn't pretty. And I didn't think I ever wanted to see it again. Yeah, it was, it was something else. And, but we have these, what I observe people, they have these senders and there's receivers. And I can tell when people are in a really dynamic conversation because it's like this cord, this actually, this, this tube. And it's like it's dynamic between the two. In the same token, you can have receivers for barbs. Let's say, you have a difficult person in your life who likes to zing you. And you have a dozen little receivers. And they zing you and zing you and zing you until 12th. And then you flare. We do, we are our aura. We are who we are. If we practice our meditation and our loving thoughts, we tend to get there more easily. If we are a temper reactionary person, we also tend to go there very easily. But just because we're one or the other doesn't mean we need to stay there. First of all, we just need to acknowledge it. Now, if you have someone in your life who is sending you a barb, your best defense is none. 
you allow it to just shoot through you. You've all had the experience, you're on the road, and you know driver X is in road rage. You just know it. And you back off the pedal and say, uh-oh, I don't think I want to be around that person. You can feel that rage. Or you walk into, you know, airplane travel. You know, there's always people upset because their flight got changed or something and they're taking it out on some poor innocent person who's trying to change their flight for them. But we can all feel that and it can just allow it to go through us or we can grab a hold of it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it to find a home with me. And sometimes when it's so intense, it's hard not to have it be a home. So then you remove yourself. I don't look in malls. I don't look in general. I am only looking to a degree with you. Your aura is your personal mail. I don't read it in a, unless it's just very inadvertent. And even if it is, it is very private and it isn't spoken to anyone. Um, we have a right to privacy. And we have a right to be who we really are. And again, I was so fortunate. My parents helped me understand. Intuitively, I understood much of it, but because of being raised in the society and going to round table and having going to Orcas camp in Dralaya. I mean I had I had so many safe environments for myself that it was wonderful. I know before I came here and actually before I even agreed to come here I couldn't believe I mean actually that's what my son said my gosh mom you're going public. I said I know. <laughs> However after I arrived, I felt very comfortable. You all made me feel comfortable. You, you have a collective aura of you that's accepting, and I felt welcome, and I felt uh, accepted. I didn't feel as quirky as I have many times in my past. What we want to avoid with the thought forms on the barbs back just momentarily is you don't want to get into the that beautiful strong connection can also be a strong negative connection and we don't want to feed that sometimes there are people in our life that we just we just have to wait till next lifetime we did all we could we we did as much as we could and we just need to say, well, I'll meet you again next lifetime, only this time don't be my whatever you were. <laughs> could, could you be another part of my life, maybe? Because we've all been brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers with each other, I'm sure. Many of us have seen each other many times. Meditation. Um, I loved Dora's explanation to my husband when we were first married we went up to Pumpkin Hollow and Dora was there and it was the first time that Gary had met Dora now um, when I met Gary I'm 19 and I met him and I was just like Mount Vesuvius I just told him all about myself I'd never in my whole life done it but somehow of course Gary and I've been together many many times and so he just knew everything about me and he knew everything I could do and I just couldn't stop talking. I mean, you know, there was just, there were just no barriers at all. So, oh well, what, obviously I married the man. But after we were married, we went up to Pumpkin Hollow and Dora was explaining to him about meditation and what I loved was her statement about meditation is that it is an egoless state, state and that it can be achieved in a moment with a beautiful sunset, with music, with a moment of a breath. Of course, meditation is wonderful when we are all together and we're in a, 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 a meditation where we are 30 minutes together and we're achieving something as a group. But individually, we can be there in a moment. And that is, I felt, so instructive 
Gary is a classical pianist and understood immediately what she was talking about. Although he was raised in a religion with prayer, and prayer is wonderful. Prayer is its own form of meditation. As yesterday, I loved all of the prayers that I just loved it. And I also will say that I watched, and it was really beautiful. And a few of them were absolutely incredible what the words created. And that was fun. It was sort of like its own little lightning show. That was, that was very nice. Um, as theosophists, of course, we all accept our various realms and are in uh, appreciation of them and also in appreciation of their place and in acceptance, total acceptance of your direction or what is comfortable for you. Very briefly, we talked, um, it has been brought up in terms of the chakras. And of course, the chakras, um, many, there are many wonderful books on it. And I love Leadbeater and his description of chakras. And I think that's the most reasonable. And, you know, they are whirling energies. And they are about this size, depending on who you are. And they are in meditation aligned. And we are looking for the crown chakra. When, when we are open, that is when we have our most creative thought. That is when we are one with each other and one with the universe and one with this earth and trees and we are in harmony with each other. If we are um, in that state, we tend to choose better for ourselves. And as we choose better, we influence those around us. We also cultivate our gardens. We create the beautiful flowers. Smells and aromas are wonderful for our brains. Um, we want to uh, use those energy fields in the whole balance of how we are each and every day. I think that as far as the um, understanding the aura, I think there isn't anything finer than Dora Kuntz's work. Um, and I also actually at this time would like to, if I can manage this, we have a beautiful saying from her that I love and I'll just leave that for a moment. If you've not looked at her book, I encourage you to pick it up. Um, I noticed downstairs they have beautiful pictures of some of the, an artist's rendition of things that she described as far as the aura. The aura is really this, um, it's more like a rainbow in terms of how it looks. It, you know, it's this amorphous um, field. And healing is the balance of the body. We are in healing each and every day. We are healing a wound, either physically or emotionally. We are healing and growing ourselves each and every day, at least that's our theosophical goal, each and every day that we are achieving something as far as uh, an enlightened feeling an enlightened spirit. What I like about Dora's statement is that even medically, we just remove the obstacles. It's really the body is this magnificent brain that's within all of those cells. Harry Van Gelder was my mentor and definitely a genius in this area, was able to 
identify each of the vibrational en energies. As we talked before, we are a vibrational body. We are, and I think that the doctor of the future will understand that maybe more clearly than they do now. And I'm speaking medical doctor of the future. In that, if we can measure each of the vibrational energies, we can also measure the vibrational energy of disease or unease. Then it is our job as practitioners to reverse that unease or disease and turn it not from a destructive force but a constructive force. And in the healing aspect, we actually ha can measure down to the cellular level which what each of the cells present. And as we are, they have uh, done some incredible studies of what we have, what um, I'm trying to think of the person who did the study, but there was a group, and please, if you know this information, share that with the group. There is a group in Europe, I believe, of nuns who live a very long time, clear into their hundreds, and they have given permission, they gave permission to be autopsied, their brain to be autopsied, because they were so vibrant, and they were specifically the physicians that were involved were looking at whether or not dementia was even in these brains. And what they actually discovered is that each of these women did have forms of dementia, but because they were still studying and still learning and still growing, it didn't affect their lives. Now, isn't that something to take? We all, as we age, think about dementia. We think about it, I mean, we have so many aspects of dementia that are forth. We, we read all of these articles. And one of the things I always tell people is that we have thousands of pathways to the same information. Thousands of pathways to a particular phone number. Well, if you lose that phone number, it's okay. So that particular pathway got burned. Just say it 10 times and burn a new pathway. So the important thing is, is don't react. Just say, oh, well, never mind. I need to learn it another way. And also encourage yourself to get new information. I was amused when you were talking about, you know, prior to the computer, one of the things we are in a technological system in a society now, and it is important for us to keep up and to learn new things, but there's also game playing, and there's also mnemonics and things that help us in terms of keeping our brains alive and keeping our selves in balance. Um, we are a pulsating, vibrating entity, and we want that pulsating, vibrating enemy, uh, entity to be positive and sending out all those good vibrations. Sometimes, and I've certainly seen this many, many times, uh, people who have difficulty with depression, uh, we're all kind of muddy at the bottom. You know, that's kind of where we stand. Um, the, the bottom of us, you know, is a little muddy. And it's okay because I just feel like, well, we're next to the earth. And it's okay to be a little muddy. But sometimes with depression, it's not just mud. It's kind of a muddy gray. And it spreads. When someone is depressed and they walk into a room, you can watch it just spread like ooze. What's interesting is to see it spread and not adhere to lots, but then to some, it will come up. And then they will experience the same depression as that person. You say to yourself, I'm sure the person who's depressed isn't really trying to spread that good news. They just don't know what to do with it. Um, now, in the same token, you can come into a room with loving, wonderful thoughts, and it also will spread throughout the environment. And, and those who have those same loving, wonderful thoughts can bring it forward and will all resonate lovely. Clairvoyantly, probably the easiest field to look at is the etheric. The etheric is outside of us by, oh, six to eight inches. And when we're healthy, 
it's fluffy. My dad used to call them feathers. He'd ask me, how are my feathers today, Robin? And I like that term, feathers. And as we get ill, the feathers start drooping. And as we're really ill, they become flat. And one of the things that I like is the idea that I can fluff my own feathers. And the truth is, there is some reality to that. Many of the exercise practices, like in yoga and in Tai Chi, there's lots of arm movement. And, there's, and I'm not, I don't do either very well, so I'm not going to pretend that I can. But there's many, many of those exercise programs actually are doing exactly that with breath in, breath out. We're actually energizing that particular etheric field. When we are ill, it shows in the etheric field. Uh, in fact, sometimes I can see the illness there before the person is actually manifested it physically. Besides, of course, the um, etheric, then of course the aura is the emotional body, and that's the one that keeps changing. We do have, as when you look at Dora's book, there are people, well, we do. We all have symbols. Our work is sort of around us. Um, it's it's you know, our work is, is sort of in the middle of us. And um, if, you, if you could see mine, you know, this is my work. It is the, um, this is the important work that I have in this lifetime. And it is the, the help of others in their own personal quest. And those of you who are, that's the thing that's wonderful about this particular arena is that you're all of service. And that is really a beautiful sight to see. Um, I'm not saying you don't like new shoes, but that's not your real goal or a pretty purse. It, it just isn't your goal. You're of service to this humanity and you understand your importance in this world. And by your very nature, you bring that importance forward and it it not only shows, it touches others. Your individual position is like its own beacon. Um, Dora did me a great favor as a youngster. I, my mother insisted that, uh, Dora was lovely and would occasionally grant a reading and um, my mother decided that I needed to have my, I needed a reading by, Do by Dora. And I remember being terrified because of course I'm in the middle of everything and I'm thinking, gosh, what if she looks at me and says, Robin, you're all wet. And what you're seeing is really not there. And somehow this wonderful woman did not say that and she validated me at a very young age and um, later as did Harry, which was wonderful. It's important, those of us who are in this position, all of you out there, as you meet others who are maybe like me or have a certain level of sensitivity, that you do validate and you do accept their words and you do help them find the wonderful readings that are out there. I mean, our library is filled with wonderful people. I was also fortunate to meet Jeffrey Hodson very early when he was at the Portland Lodge. He was also very helpful. Um, these are things that I think are important for us as theosophists, that we, this is our role. Our goal is to keep the mechanical part of our mind. Our mind is not our brain. Our brain is the mechanical part of our mind. This is our mind. When we meditate, this is what. We are aligning ourselves to open to the, the crown, to open all the way up and open and out so that we can bring through the knowledge or the experience or the inspiration for our next path. Many are sometimes in a quandary in terms of what is their next best path. Meditation is your answer. You know better than anyone. We all see each other very clearly. Sometimes we don't want to see each other very clearly, but we do. We really do see each other very clearly. And it's our gift to each other to 
when asked an honest question that you give an honest response. And I think we in the society maybe are more able and are more true to that response. Um, I have been greatly influenced as a theosophist. I am absolutely thrilled that I had the background that I did. When I put this particular program together, I had all kinds of ideas, but I finally decided that I guess it was going to occur as it was going to occur. Physical balance is a necessary part of this incarnation. And if you take full responsibility for who you are, it just naturally falls that your responsibility then inspires the next and maybe enlighten someone who hadn't even thought the way you were thinking. I would just like to leave just this portion of it so I can open up some questions. That as theosophists, we understand our importance in this world, that we take positive action towards a universal brotherhood, peace, and harmony. And if we take those things and truly feel them in our hearts, they just naturally come out of our mouths. Can I answer any questions? Microphone here. You know, there is this um, uh, teaching given by Krishnamurti or some other traditions about watching our emotions, that when there is a state of anger or whatever negative emotion, instead of trying to control it, you just watch it. And one doubt that is present in many people is if by watching it without trying to control it, we are not you know, sending all those negative emotions uh, outside to the environment. Have you seen what's, what the effect is when somebody is watching the emotions as opposed to feeling them uh, identify with the emotions? Is there any difference? I don't know if you have observed that. Good question. The limbic part of our brain is our oldest part of our brain, and it actually is an emotional center. And the first 90 seconds of an emotion, rage, is out of your control. It's the limbic system enraged. After 90 seconds, you're now in it. So it's a good, it's a very good statement. You observe it. In other words, actually, what helped me about learning that information is sometimes you flare. Something, someone does something and you, you flare. But the important thing is it doesn't last beyond 90 seconds. You don't fuel it. So you actually are observing it. You acknowledge, oh, that occurred. And usually we're talking negative emotions. I don't think anybody's talking about that immense love. So 90 seconds, that's your, that's your little timeout. You can't control that first 90. Limbic took it over. We also have parts in our brain that uh, the cingulate system, I, I didn't want to get into the brain anatomy, but the cingulate system is also buried in as part of the, the, the limbic system. And um, I've done a lot of reading on Dr. Amon's work. I really like his descriptions of many of the parts of, of the body and the brain and what it does. And he describes the limbic, uh, the cingulate system as automatic negative thoughts. Okay, we've all been in those automatic negative thoughts. It's that cycle. What I usually suggest to people is there is a nugget of start. What you're looking for is what's the nugget? What set me off on that cycle? And if you can figure out the nugget, generally, in fact, I don't know any time that it doesn't dissipate. And the rubber band is a nice idea also, but I find for myself, when I'm in that automatic negative, I, I don't like it. It's very uncomfortable. If I can find that nugget, the so oh, I know what set me off, and it's generally something 
very inconsequential, but it just set me on that motion. So just say to yourself, oh, yes, that part of the brain, I know. It's the old part. Anything else? Wow, everybody went up at once. Here you go. You mentioned that um, a lot, uh, almost all of us have maybe at least two people that come with us or something. Is um, I was not sure what you meant, but but is that sometimes that we experience that we like hear things, not you know out loud, but are, this, are those the voices that we hear or the guidance? Sometimes, or? yes. Yeah, we tend to, I think those of us, not so much because I've you know, got my feet in both camps, but I've found people that I talk to will talk themselves out of it. Oh, I didn't really hear it. Now, also, we can pick up on an errant thought, like every, I'm sure you've all experienced an odd thought that entered your brain. You simply read someone else's mind. And it might not be your, First of all, say, is that mine or is that someone else's? Was that for me or was that someone else's? They, these beings that we have, some of the times the beings that, I've ex that I see are, are, are literally beings from uh, incarnations. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow because that's developing a higher level of consciousness. But, but for this conversation, um, we have them, I have people who, people, beings who help me in my work. And I also have people, my mother, I know, I, I know mom and dad are here, there's, there's no doubt. Uh, we have people that loved us, truly loved us and care about us and, and you know, your, your dad who pokes me and, you know, they really care about us and they do give us this information and it's important to acknowledge it and at least, okay, because they can't help us unless we ask for help. That's part of meditation also, is allowing yourself not only to be centered, but to allow yourself to, ask, you are asking for help in this world. Does that answer? Okay. Um, I was wondering if you might be able to speak a little more about intent. If somebody has positive intent, has positive thoughts about a situation or a person and doesn't act on it but just thinks, um, how does that affect your brain or is something else communicated or is the same for the negative without acting just the thought of a negative and a positive? What does that affect or what might that affect be on our brains? Well, I know that um, when you continually listen to the words that you say about yourself, listen to your silent words. They're very important. Listen to your criticisms. We are far too critical, far too self-critical. It's very difficult to balance when you are beating yourself with negativity. Oh, you couldn't do this or, or something negative. Intent, intent is eventually verbalized, if not in words, in action. Listen to your words, they're very powerful. Did that answer your question? Hi. Um, uh, what made me think of this is you were talking about when people are kind of, when people are kind of muddy at the base of their work, kind of sad or depressed. And I'm not talking about with uh, Dr. Amen. He talks about crushing your ants. Yeah. You know, your yes, automatic yes. negative thoughts. Yes, yes. I'm talking about people with like clinical depression, that kind of thing. What would be the best thing for, and all of us here are in, you know, good people. I'm not talking about someone who's given up on themselves. Uh, if they had like a great deal of sadness, how would they approach uh, correcting that? You know, there, there's still a level of them who's trying to be good, but they, they're weighed down. So I, I guess in a lot of this,
kind of talk, people don't address clinical depression so much, they talk about just sad emotions. So I'd like to hear your take on that. On clinical depression? Yes. Clinical depression is a disease. And as any disease, it has its own character. And no one who is clinically depressed wants to be. And there are times that it is important, again, I'm very practical, there are times we need chemical interference with such things. I have had patients that I have urged to get chemical help because nothing naturally helps them. Sometimes there are misfirings in the brain. Clinical depression is a misfiring. It is, um, and we're talking the diseased clinical depression that leads you to suicidal thoughts and no one wants to be there. You need help with someone that you can talk to. You need a therapist that you feel comfortable with to help you in this journey to not be clinically depressed. Now, interestingly, let's talk about suicide. My experience with suicide is that when someone has chosen suicide, it is an attractive choice and it is difficult the next lifetime not to choose it again. It is its own, well, it, I'm controlling my death. It's, I have worked with people who literally every day work at not making this choice. Now, I think, you know, when I've done the look and the help of looking back, I realize they've chosen that route over and over and over, and their great feat this lifetime will be to live their full life. Now, in my explanation, as I was growing up, when I was talking about lifetimes, and when my teachers told me that, okay, if we look at our lifetime as 180 degrees, we're born, and a good 170 degrees is life. Well, but there's that 10% that's not. There are, we are of free choice. We choose every day what we wish to do. And sometimes those choices put us in harm's way so that that 180 degrees, maybe my full lifetime, I had a dad who lived to be 95, I had a grandmother who lived to be 100, I, told my son, I'm very sorry, but I'm probably going to be here a long time. Assuming I continue to make maybe choices that are, are healthy for me, but what if I started making choices that weren't healthy for me? I am then going towards another level which ends the lifetime sooner than it maybe would have here. The suicides come in with the same 180 degrees. I don't know why I call it, it was, that was how it was described to me, the full 180 degrees, but they keep shortening it. So their goal is to see if they can make it all the way to the end. Did that help? Yeah. Change. Now let's talk about non-clinical <coughs> depression. I don't know anyone who can make a change without it being through love. No one changes by being critical. And that is important for self. If I wish to make a change to not be a perfectionist, then I need to lovingly tell myself not to do things like sew because that brings out that horrible percept. You know, the next last time I brought out something to sew, Gary said, please, could I go buy you a skirt? <laughs> <laughs> not a nice person when you're sewing. <laughs> lovingly making changes. We, we, Yes. I had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Are you, uh, it seems like a very popular and seemingly effective uh, healing modality that's become quite recognized these days. Is it uh, EFT? Uh, yes. Emotion. Are you familiar with that? Not I, as not not enough to. Okay, I was just wondering if you could comment on what if you had observed it or if there was anything you could say toward that. And if not, that's okay. No, I, it, that's the tapping, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. I have had uh, some patients who have um, 
had some incredibly positive responses and I used to refer to a therapist who did that and she uh, as it was described uh, I think she tapped various places and that it was incredibly uh, an, an incredibly positive way to make a change I, I liked her work and then she lost didn't go into practice or left practice and I don't have anyone else to refer to so that's all my knowledge of it but it seemed very good at the time in your uh, work that you've done, have you had any experience working with veterans with PTSD? Yes. Tell me about that. Now we're talking chemical change. We're talking brain chemical change. We can have enough shock to the system. Um, Harry taught me early in my life about concussions and taught me how to figure out whether a person was, had experienced a concussion and that was an undiagnosed concussion. Because so many concussions um, or traumas would lead to disease. That is a case of an emotional blow that's happened over and over. It's, it's taken that person not only out of their comfort zone, it blew them out of their comfort zone and they got into a zone that they couldn't, they couldn't handle. So now it's become a chemical change in the brain and they fall in the same category as the clinical depression. We have to change the chemicals. Now, in some cases I have worked effectively with, I have a variety of um, therapeutic exercises and supplements and homeopathics. I, I work a lot as a homeopath that have been very effective. It depends on the patient. It depends on number one if they acknowledge the PS if they acknowledge it. Number two if they are willing to do the work. Uh, and some are self-medicating. Every patient I've ever had who has been addicted is all, it's all self-medication. They just don't feel normal. They want to feel normal. They're just trying to feel normal. And so they found that this helped them. And then pretty soon it didn't help them and then it became something else. So it did become a chemical change. Uh, this one's lighter. The uh, Edgar Casey, Clairvoyant, yeah. recommended yeah. Uh, that the um, people uh, come up with a balance, we're talking balance here, so with an ideal of the physical, mental, and uh, spiritual life that they lead. And I just wondered if you would uh, comment on the uh, concept of ideal. I, th yes, ideal for me is when I am in a truly meditative place. That is when I am open, I'm hearing, I'm listening, and I'm presenting. I've done a lot of study of Edgar Casey. I've suggested many things Edgar Casey. I think he was brilliant in many things he suggested. I tend not to suggest to people to think of their ideal, hmm, I'm sorry, every time I think of ideal, I think Hollywood, you know, and that's like, blah. not an ideal, yeah. So ideal for me is when I am one with me, when I am completely outside of inconsequential things. When I view, when I am in the other world, there is no space time. It does not exist. And um, when you allow me to look at you, there is no space time. I'm just seeing who you are and experiencing who you are and you're very lovely. So um, ideal is, is your, your ideal, your non-critical ideal. Anyone else? I'd like to follow up one additional step on the PTSD. If you see it as a chemical change in the brain, how do you um, 
address that? How do you get its attention? Okay. Well, first of all, if you are a patient in my office, you have given me a permission to look at you entirely, which also means you've given me permission to communicate with the true you, not necessarily the person that's sitting on the table. And sometimes the communication has to start with the true you before it can happen to the physical you. Sometimes physical you is completely blocked off from the real you. When I was a little girl, I used to, um, of course I use sight sometimes for entertainment, but it was educationally entertaining. I was, you understand, I, you know, I would sometimes be waiting for someone and I'd be sitting, and one of the most interesting things as a child was to see someone who was severely disabled, I mean really disabled, who was, you know, twisted up in themselves or a child. Often it was the children. I was so interested in, you know, this person. And always the real person would, I would say all but maybe two times did I experience the real um, entity of this person who was beaming, smiling, and saying, look how good she's doing. In other words, they've taken this and they're going with it. So this lifetime, this was their challenge. Because we all know it's not our good days, it's our challenging days that define us. It, that's, who def that's what really defines us. It's all of those challenges we have. So in that particular case, the challenge is maybe first to contact that to see how we can make that connection. If you're a patient in my office, you're already knowing that I have some ability. If you are, yes, you have, I have some ability. Most, most of them do. And so then that's, that's where the communication begins. Because sometimes they're just completely cut off. I want to ask a question about medical, metaphysical healing in, in one's lifetime. So we talk about uh, from trauma, psychological healing, whatnot. Um, do you have any examples? Or have you seen any possibilities of any people who you know just had decades of criticism leveled at them? Either they grew up that way, where it's just constant criticism, uh, negativity in the home, and maybe their their work past led them to continue being in that situation one way or the other, their choices, whatnot. Have you witnessed anyone who's faced their, their psychological trauma and healing completely, completely heal in a metaphysical sense to where that person ended up being the person that he or she was when she, he or she came into this world or the person that he or she was meant to be when they came into this world? Have you seen a complete healing of anyone that they grew up or, or was subject to intense criticism over decades? Yes. But let's first say, sometimes this is an in incarnation. This karmic incarnation may very well have begun the last one. And you're finishing it this time. And you may be finishing it up until your last breath. But you don't have to come back and do it again. This was the thing I loved about Linda Joe. She said, I'm just trying to help the next Linda Joe have a better and easier time. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a great idea. Because, you know, I've been a Robin or a Robert or a, you know, I've been a lot of things. And, and I'm just hoping, and, which is I am respectful of what I have. And I hope next lifetime I get to have it again so that I can continue on this path of knowledge. And maybe next lifetime, I'll be incarnated where everybody is, and it's just, we just talk about it. I mean, remember Harry talking about growing up in the manor and how they would be given this, um, you know, given a, a challenge, and then they would go into their meditative state, and then they'd come out of it, and then they would tell each other, you know, what they did, and I just thought, oh, how, how, 
I, I was jealous, so those are probably the funny colors. And because I wished so much I could have been in there and not so isolated. A lot of you have sensitivities, um, but I very rarely do not see a child that is not clairvoyant. You know, children are, along with animals, not just cats. And it's, it's, you know, that's how we communicate with our animals, our dogs, our cats. I mean, they don't, they see our intent. They may or may not understand our words, but they certainly see our intent. But yes, I have seen a healing. In terms of uh, service, when you're working with uh, oh, when you're working with a patient, or have you worked with patients where you've been able to either prescribe or observe them, going from a self-centered uh, energetic state to maybe um, a state of service, whether I don't know they're taking care of a, a pet or a child or or uh, doing some sort of community service, that type of thing. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's like in, in a self-centered state, you may feel sorry for yourself, but yet then the shift that happens when you go into a service state, were you able to observe that type of? Yes, definitely. By the time, if, if you've elected to come into my world you've already understood there's something wrong in your world and you're just trying to understand how to get from that world to this world because the world you're in is very uncomfortable even if it's just a spinal complaint it's just uncomfortable and you want to reach to another world um, I tend not to have as patients those that are so self-centered that they aren't of service and I don't have friends that are anything but in service. Um, I have acquaintances who are like that, and they only know this much of me. Because, <laughs> but yeah, I think if you, yes, I have observed that. We all have our challenges, and sometimes it's through the challenge that we understand where we really are. And um, we would like to think that we are maybe someplace different than we are, but it is when it's really front and center, that's who we truly are. The interesting thing is, is when we die, the experience I've had with people that I get to see again, um, like my mom, when my mom, after my mom passed away, she for a long time was still the same age that she was when she died, but now she's really very young. She's much younger. This is my dad. And, you know, it's, and I remember when I was working with a very sweet, wonderful man, um, Osti B, and I asked him, so Osti, how old are you going to be? And Osti, if all of you who knew Osti, um, I remember as a young girl, Osti, and we just thought he was a heartthrob. I mean, he was just this very, very handsome, handsome man. And he said, oh, I don't know, probably my 50s. And I thought, isn't that interesting? So he wasn't identified at all when he was 20s or 25. I had a patient um, who, a very um, a woman who was uh, Baptist and was very strong as a Baptist, but somehow she.